Awesome. Yeah, so you and I have only spoken on group calls, so I actually haven't said this to you, but <clears throat> I, uh, I discovered you through, I think, Watches Ben Shapiro once, or watch, oh. one of those, one, the comedy phase, I guess, I guess it's like four years ago. <clears throat> and then like two years ago, I deleted YouTube, and I didn't watch anything. And then this year, I was like, all right, I need to figure out this YouTube beast. I've been mm. intimidated by it, you know, I've tried and failed and whatever. And I was like, I'm only going to do YouTube if I can make videos like Captain Sinbad. So... I went on your channel. <laughs> I started doing my own research and then serendipitously had the coaching program. So I was like, well, this is obviously a no brainer. So anyway, I just want to say I appreciate your stuff, even though I, I haven't watched anything until like recently, mm. other than a few years ago. And I really appreciate the, uh, the artistic film like and non cringe take you have towards storytelling on YouTube. Let's say <laughs> I appreciate that. There's so many people in the space who are, more successful than me and you seem like such a um i don't know deep person and that's what i got the sense from you from you know reviewing your videos these last two months so the fact that you even like think that i was the person you know that you wanted to emulate in any capacity kind of blows my mind you know because you're kind of like a cool guy so if like a cool guy <laughs> watches my videos and likes my videos then uh and that's that's high praise you know like a lot of these other youtubers I feel like their audience is a bunch of dorks. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We don't have to say names, but you brought up another famous YouTuber, like yeah. comparing your thumbnails. And I'm like, that's actually what kind of intimidated me about YouTube. This idea that you have to do kind of things that were clickbaity that didn't feel so good. Whereas like your thumbnails and I'm actually super proud of my thumbnails now, just for the couple of videos I did under your tutelage. It's like, Oh, this is, this is something I'm just proud of to have in my, on my computer, even if no one looks at it, like it's cool. Totally. Yeah. I wanted this. I never want to lose that sense. There was an era. I can't tell you exactly when, when someone would ask about my channel or someone would mention it and I would not want them to see the channel. You know, it'd be like, uh, you know, I, for some reason I wouldn't want to bring it up. And now if it comes up, the only thing I get embarrassed about is like the nature of some of the, I guess, dating dynamics, topics or it just feels i feel exposed but it doesn't feel like the <clears throat> i'm ever embarrassed of and if they actually click into the videos i'm like you know what no matter what you think of this video it represents the i would say the highest class of this side of youtube i actually genuinely feel that about my own videos it's like the most earnest version of this side of youtube there's no nothing is phoned in and it's it, i don't know how you felt about by the way, I hope I'm not peeking because it does go into the red. Maybe I should just set it further away. I think it's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's. I, I just think a lot of YouTube, it feels like people are just phoning it in. But really the heart of the, the coaching program is like work really hard and try as hard as you can on these steps, <laughs> you know, like on yeah. these elements of the content creation process. So uh, it, it's the biggest lesson that I've learned from this journey, and I don't know, you know, you can tell me what your experience has been now, like at least thinking about some of these elements more consistently is that it's, uh, it's like a, the biggest personal development journey there is. You have to, you can't lie to yourself because the, the result that is the video is a direct correlation to your efforts. Those last two weeks or three weeks that you're working on that video, you know, totally. Yeah. yeah, cause I've been creating content for a long time in yeah. some form. And, uh, actually one thing that was great, even though it was disappointing is like my last video took a long time and I wasn't so happy with it, yeah. but just kind of recognizing, and I want to ask you about your storytelling, uh, philosophy too, but looking at it like a film, like I didn't pursue acting like you, but I did work in film briefly and just like recognizing like, Oh, even a short film takes months so that my 15 minute YouTube video took two months of my life, even though I was disappointed with that. That's just kind of how it goes. Like I worked as a screenwriter for one film and we wrote that script for six months. And I was like, I can't believe it took like, you know, this is like a 90 minute movie. Like how could this take so long? But that's just how it goes for quality, I guess. Dude, imagine we operate at this scale and we kind of get bummed out about our videos. There are people who made like a Hallmark movie or like Sharknado or something, you know, like someone didn't see their kids for a full year because they were making Sharknado or like <laughs> cocaine bear. You know what I mean? Like people have lost years of their lives and they, maybe they set out to make something great. That's something that kind of haunts me 
is like you mm -hmm. no one i don't think anyone sets out to make a bad youtube video or a bad film they just you know it just feels weird because the more you give to it the less in control you really are and at some point like you tried hard as fuck on that samurai video like i saw that effort you know for sure um but the scale of that story was so much bigger than your youtube journey thus far but the like no matter what happens you will always have that experience and it's gonna it's gonna literally affect everything you make from here on out i sometimes think to myself i'm making these videos for god i'm like making these videos just to show god that i try at life and I just, I can't do anything else. <laughs> like I can't control how good they are. I can't even directly control how good they are, you know? And I'm not necessarily even like a religious person. I'm not a non-religious person. I'm just, I guess I'm just confused more than anything. But sometimes I give myself these paradigms to operate under. I'm like, okay, today I'm scripting. I'm trying to, I'm just gonna do it as best as I can just for the Lord to see me like doing the best I can with like the job I ended up in, in life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just out, out of curiosity, you were raised Hindu? I was, yeah. Okay. Um, actually, I'm curious. Uh, like, what what are your core tenets around spirituality or the universe at large? Yeah, well, it's interesting because it's been changing a lot recently. Like, I was raised Buddhist and Catholic. Like, my dad's Sri Lankan and my mom's Filipino. So I had that kind of confusion. And, like, I was an angry atheist for a while because I thought, you know, that's just how it was. But then I got into... I basically started doing mushrooms in my 20s and that kind of changed my view of the universe. Mm. But actually now, honestly, as a father, I really see the value in monotheism, mm. like just believing that there's something like a, a, like a singular figure. I don't necessarily believe it's true, but I think it's just a good model to have. And I think for men even, like, like to just to think there's a bigger father that you can lean on kind of thing and it's singular and not maybe not even nuanced, but I almost see the value of that kind of conservative thinking now. And it's yeah. funny because my Instagram is, is for some reason is a lot like, like what comes up in my feed are like Islamic life coaches. It's like a new, it's like a new genre in personal development. Maybe it's always been there, but I didn't know about it. But anyway, I don't know. My, my, this is not really answering the question, but my view of the world, I know there are things beyond our conception. I do think there's along the lines of the samurai thing, there's something to reducing entropy. Like, I think that is. That is it. You, you ever heard of the book uh, Shantaram? I have it. I read like 50 pages of it. Dude, it's, it's, it's so good. I mean, you listen to the audio book. I've listened to it like three times. It's like 80 hours, but it's like, it's so good. Anyway, one of the characters in there who's based on a real Bombay um, mob boss, that's mm -hmm. kind of his view of God. It's like, it's like going to infinite complexity. So like anything random is bad. And anything specific and increasing in complexity is good. And that was kind of just his view. It's a great and I, view. And I like it, you know? Yeah, it's, the, it's also the philosophy around flow. And uh, Mihai Chisen Mihai in his book said, for a relationship to work well, you know, because uh, it's, hard, it's hard to maintain that same level of like lust or just carnal desire for a person three or four years after being with them. But if you can grow more complex in the relationship and if the complexity increases, and that's like the nature of life as well, you know, your business, whatever it might be, if the complexity increases, then you go deeper into something, it's, it remains interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think that's a great philosophy. For me, yeah. like I think with spirituality or I, I really wish I could 100% believe in God, like in the monotheistic version, like my personal trainer, he like believes in Jesus, you know, it's just such a clear thing. And I don't not believe in Jesus, but I, it's hard for me to have that like completely assured faith. Yeah. But there are areas of my life where I just tap into such a deep sense. Like right now, I'm putting myself through this lifestyle curriculum where I am meditating about an hour a day, like two 30 minute sessions a day. And then when it comes to like sexual discipline, I haven't had like a a sexual release in over a month and I feel very pure and I haven't drank alcohol in a couple months now. I feel very like in connection with just a very pure way of being. And I, I feel like connected to God a little more. It becomes a lot easier to believe actually. And things are going well too, you know, like obviously it's not surprising when you meditate a good amount, then that clarity translates to everything you do. 
So it makes me think there's no way that atheism is the answer, you know, but mm -hmm. it's hard to, it's hard to have a uh, definite answer for me like Jesus. But sometimes I find myself thinking about such questions, which is probably why I swerved this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. No, actually, I don't, I don't know if you watch MMA, but I'm so inspired by the, the, the newly, the new rise of Islamic fighters like i don't know if you watch ufc but khabib and this is, there's a bunch of these guys like they're super devout religious they have like the chin beard and everything right. and of course and they speak about god every time they win but they also win all the time <laughs> right like they're like they're so good they're so much better and so much more disciplined than everyone else and whether or not the belief system is true it's like they have this framework that makes them kick everyone's ass like in real life so almost who cares it, it has a power inherent in itself you know like maybe the framework is useful but there is just inherent power, I think, in living a clean life. And it's hard to be motivated to live a clean life if you don't believe in anything. Mm -hmm. you know, like what, are some of, what are some of your like core practices for like living well? Uh, journaling is the, the one. Really? Like literally like the more pages I fill, even with nonsense, mm -hmm. the better everything is. And I forget that a lot of time, but like that's it. And it's the one practice that I've kept up in my life. I mean, there's other things like working out, but I, I, I actually love working out. I think it's because I started young enough that it's just wired into me that it's fun. Yeah. So it's not really something I need discipline for. But journaling is probably the thing I do need to remind myself of and like has like clear dividends. When when did you first start do doing it and like how what sort of changing? Like, why would you say that is the thing? Uh I started doing it, I think in a spiritual crisis of like, whatever, quarter life crisis, not knowing what to do. Right. I think it came up from, um, you know, the artist way, by yeah. Julia Camp. Yeah. So I started doing morning pages. Oh, I had a, like, I had a spiritual mentor who said I should write a letter to God every day. And I didn't really dig it, but I also read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance that month where he's talking about quality. I'm like, oh, that's the same thing as God, the way he talks. I don't know if you're familiar with the book, but no. he spends an entire 800 page book trying to define quality, but you could replace quality with God. Mm. Um, anyway, so I started writing a letter to quality every day. And especially I was trying to be a writer. So this seemed like a good thing to do. And I don't know, I just, I just feel sane. Like all of my life problems, I, I, I fill out like anything I want to think about. And now like my career is based on, you know, this is true for any content creator. Yeah. Um, so it's just like, uh, the more pages I fill, the better things are. Also, last thing I had an yeah. ayahuasca journey where I saw Athena, like the goddess, the Greek goddess. Yeah. And like, shit. she looked at me and she said, if you write two hours a day, I'll make you wildly successful. And if you don't, you Holy won't. Fuck. and I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> you know? That's, I probably, that probably was a very real thing because Athena mm -hmm. is, um, the goddess of war, right? Something similar. She is associated war and with wisdom and virginity. Wonderful. Yeah and stuff and uh i mean uh in hinduism the goddess Dur durga hinduism i think is i don't know too many other traditions outside of it i mean athena is the other example where the embodiment of like warfare and like being tactical and like successful with combat is a woman not a not a man mm -hmm. like none of the guys there are archers and stuff but like durga is the main she like hmm. the story was that durga in this great black age where there were like demons everywhere Durga was one, the one with the sword who would kill all these demons, but because they were so toxic, when their blood would hit the ground, they would respawn like a video mm. game. So Durga's sister, Kali, started like drinking their blood before it would hit the ground. So there's Kali, she's like got the wild tongue and she's like the black goddess. So she would like absorb all their poison. And so then that's how they brought an end to the, the Black Ages. And Kali looks kind of scary. Even, I mean, like in Indiana Jones, they're like playing to, praying to Kali. Mm -hmm movies uh so all these i find re when you have <laughs> references or images like that it's actually like i mean dude I, I actually believe that if you wrote two hours a day maybe you have been there's no way that wouldn't lead to enormous results especially on youtube totally i do most days <laughs> not always and actually i've noticed when i haven't kept up with it everything tanks like yeah. creative quality sanity etc also because your style of video making at least what I've noticed, your greatest strength lies in going deep. So, I mean, one of the core tenets of our program is like market research. But I mean, you are almost outside market research. It's almost like things go better for you when you focus on what you're interested in, which you probably would discover more and more through writing. And mm -hmm. then 
maybe either retroactively market researching or focusing on the clarity of the message so much, maybe like through like, you know, principle one, two, three, four, that eventually one would hit, but then they, they cascade back to watching all of your videos because of the depth. Cause you talk yeah. so like you talk, you don't talk like a normal person. <laughs> uh, thanks, I guess. <laughs> it's a great thing, dude. Who wants to? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, the hardest thing for me has been because, like, even for this last video on like attracting your soulmate or whatever, yeah. uh, I've written like so many pages and I'm trying to cut it. That the hardest part for me is cutting it down into like things that, you know, make sense yeah. for a 15 minute video. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Anyway. Um, I did actually want to go back and ask you something. You mentioned uh, the, the one thing you're embarrassed about is dating content, or I don't know if you said embarrassed, but yeah. are you talking about like women that you date seeing you talk about dating or is it people in general? I guess there is a hope for me in my channel where it is um, very clean and aspirational in a very clean way, as in maybe like unattached to anything like I want the, uh, everything great in life is infused with sexuality and sexual energy, but I would want it to be unsaid and unaddressed. And right now, some at least some of the time, I'm talking about dating and sexuality directly rather than it just being infused in something bigger in terms of scale. So I think I will work up towards those kinds of videos, but it, it is some of the stuff you're describing. You know, my parents watching the videos, my parents' friends, if I am dating someone new, her coming across my videos and, you know, like the nature of my side of YouTube, if I put in a girl in the thumbnail, mm -hmm. it will just get more views. So I just constantly feel like my image is pulling me towards two different directions. One is like this perceived notion of Captain Sinbad as like the unsaid player, even though I'm not, you know, I'm still single and dating, but I'm not like uh it's not my primary objective. And then the other one is like, like a very almost like true or artists calling type vibe, you know, where mm -hmm. the, the videos are, it's like, I can either follow my sentiments deeper and it would be more short films and just heartfelt videos that are story driven, more narrative, but they would be more expensive to make. It's harder to make them market research. So it's harder to guarantee mm -hmm. the views. And then as, as a result of the views, views don't come, we, we now are a team of six. You know, I have to pay like five different five people's salaries. So I feel that responsibility. And then the other end of it is like cashing in completely, you know, just going full red pill YouTube, my version of it, but then maybe losing, I guess, feeling a little bit embarrassed about mm. being a fish. Yeah, it's a struggle. Is it that the red pill stuff is like kind of guaranteed to do well? It is. Yeah. Okay. It's also easier to write the script for, you know, it's very matter mm. of fact. I can write my own take on those scripts and it would be my version of it. So I think it would still be a unique take, a unique angle. I try to script from a very true source now. Like I often script based off of conversations like these. Um, plus that's why I was kind of excited to do this. Cause I think literally our conversation might trigger a new script <laughs> for me. But um, yeah, I, I mean, if I literally went full red pill, I could probably double my upload speed the quality would be about the same. I wouldn't feel very confused about what's happening, uh, but I also wouldn't be challenged as much. And I don't think it's a, the truest representation of me. I'm like climbing mm -hmm. upwards towards the, a truer representation of me. And I occasionally take those risks. Right now my videos are kind of, they have a bit of both. They have that artist's mm -hmm. flair just a little bit, but not in full measure. And they're also very, they're honestly very red pill, I would mm -hmm. say. My interpretation Red ish you know yeah. um actually because like i don't i don't know the youtube landscape as well but when i've been market researching i've come across a lot of i guess red pillish or dating advice channels where 10 years ago they were getting half a million views and now they're getting a thousand it, it all seems like or maybe seven to ten years ago it's like there was maybe a peak i don't know if there's a change in the algorithm where that was really cool for a while and then now it gets suppressed or something so i wonder yeah. actually if maybe this red pill content would do really well for a year or two and then those that would actually hurt your channel yeah there was a time i think the main thing that has changed in the world is that self-improvement videos were very clean back in the day but they also didn't say as much that was genuine and 
I, I would imagine something like 60 to 70% of YouTube in general is men, you know, like more men are on YouTube than women. And I, you know, um, YouTube is going to add 2 billion users in the next five years. So I, I, the nature of the demographic is going to change more older people are going to engage with it and not, but a lot of self-improvement content five years ago, maybe when Matt Diavello was first climbing up, it was very clean. You know, it was like change your environment and make a to-do list, you know, use a checklist. The advice was very like, and the way to make those ideas interesting is they added a lot of visual flair, but then somewhere along the line, things changed and people t started talking a lot more, even like reputable people like Chris Williamson about how hard it is to be a guy. And this became now, now Rick red pill is like mainstream, you know, it's like mainstream self-improvement content. So it is definitely not edgy at all anymore. The reason maybe I would call myself red pill is because it is like a one-to-one -one with like men, a men's self-improvement channel. But there is a new era of YouTube that is on the cusp of starting. And we all need to tap into like a deeper, truer version of ourselves and like start that new niche, honestly. Like I think mm -hmm. even though I teach market research, because I teach like how to get a good base and by what I mean by uh, market research for anyone who is listening, who doesn't know, basically study what's working and, and use it as a template for your own, at least video titles, maybe not the video subject, but the titles, but it, the future is going to be like delving more and more to your own interests, honestly, which is why I think the two hours a day of writing is a great rule to adopt. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Like we, we definitely are going to need to evolve past whatever's happening right now and create the new genre. Yeah, I, I just saw this video. I mean, you probably know the channel. It's a channel that does uh, videos on subcultures. I'm forgetting his name, but it was on the Jim Bro 2.0. And he was referencing Chris Williamson of like, Jim Bros used to be meatheads, but now like, it's like an intellectual thing to yeah. lift weights and talk about dating. Like Chris Williamson, Joe Rogan was referenced. And it does seem like, yeah, that is kind of a new thing. Like, I, I mean, so many of my friends who thought lifting weights was stupid. I mean, I mean, I grew up in, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's like a liberal background. Yep. Everyone's working out now. It's like not like a unique thing anymore. And it does seem to be because of maybe YouTube shifts and, and man culture shifts online. I think also the competition for what it means to be a high quality guy, it has gone up, you know, it takes more to be, um, an impressive guy or to be seen if this is something that you care about. And I think in, it is maybe wired into us to want to feel valuable. It takes more, you know, b back in the day, if you just, people didn't really exercise that much, you know, there was like a bodybuilding revolution when Arnold Schwarzenegger came on the scene, but like weightlifting and stuff. If you look at movie stars in the sixties and stuff, like Marlon Brando was considered absolutely jacked. He was like way bigger, but the movie stars in like the fifties were like slim guys, you know? Um, and so, I think the requirements of what it means to be like an impressive man have gone up. Like going to the gym is pretty baseline. Yeah. I, I want to get your opinion on looks maxing. So I, was, yeah. I, I half recorded a video on it. Cause it's something that kind of shocked me when I got back on YouTube this year, yeah. just yeah. to see like, wow, so many men are concerned about their looks in a way that definitely wasn't a thing even a couple of years ago. And yeah. I, I assume it's because of Tinder, right? Just simply because guys are being rated for their looks more than ever before, but I know you've, you've, you've referenced it if in a few videos, yeah. like maybe you had a better take on it. I think, yeah, definitely. It wasn't, it usually wasn't the case. People also like I, I, in the West, at least they drink less alcohol. You know, we don't, we don't smoke cigarettes like they would maybe would do in the eighties. People don't like rock and roll. Gen Z is like the least substance abusing generation. Um, and I think like the things that a man was valued for in terms of attracting a partner, a lot of things are no longer relevant. Like, I don't think making a lot of money helps you that much in finding a partner. You know, you have to cross a baseline for sure. And it might be tough to cross that baseline. You know, like in Minnesota, you should probably get your income over maybe $8,000 a month. But um, women make as much money as men. So they don't really care about how much money you make for the most part, as long as you are not not making money. But they really care about looks. I think the importance of looks have gone up like 500x. And I, I will say you're like an extremely good looking guy and you're already married. So maybe it hasn't been, you know, in your mind, <laughs> you know, for a, for a little bit of time. But like, I haven't always been 
good looking or I, I feel there was an era where I was like significantly less good looking than I am now. And not that I'm like top tier, but the world treats you so differently. It, it has been night and day. I could be the same person, but I'm treated so much more nicely just for uh, kind of being like fit and attractive. Yeah. Well, I am five foot six. And actually what I was trying to, I, would, I haven't really formulated it, but comparing Lux Max and today with pickup 15 years ago, which was what the thing when I was developing myself. Yeah. Back then they really, I mean, pickup marketing specifically to sell their expensive boot camps really emphasized that looks don't matter because obviously no one would pay for pickup coaching otherwise. Yeah, yeah. But when I actually got into like, when I actually hired a pickup coach, she's like, you have to wear high heels when you go to the club. Like you just have to like, sorry, like doesn't matter how anything else you are, you have to wear heels. And I literally had heels. I mean, I had shoes with like hidden heels. I'm very embarrassed about this, but it's yeah, true. Yeah, no, it's okay. like I had, uh, I had shoes with hidden heels in it. Yeah. Um, so I guess, it, I mean, it's just a different evolution of maybe what was always true, just louder because photos matter, I guess more. Yeah. It's gotten a lot louder. Some things have always been there, you know, like the, the height thing, is it like a like deep inherent bias, you know, for sure. And uh, like my business partner, I, I mean, I, I guess he, I wouldn't say he's short, but he, I, think, I don't know how tall he is. He might be five, eight, um, but he's like, he, I've never seen someone like be able to like um, magnetize people towards him and like honestly seduce anyone he wants is what it feels like, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, like him. And his girlfriend is six foot one. And he, he basically cold approached her in a park. And I think the first thing she did was like, kind of say like, you're too short for me or whatnot. But he like completely uh, mesmerized her, you know, like he, she completely like, I guess I would say she's deeply in love with him, you know, after all this time. And I told, I was even telling him this last night, you know, it's like, I used to think some of these inherent metrics like height, you know, if you're like five foot eight, it's a lot harder for you. These were like the inherent truths of the world. And I was like going it off base of me, like I am six feet tall, but maybe I didn't feel like I was good looking or I was a little overweight. So I had a very hard time. And I was like, will you make me realize that the first qualification is your mind, like your mind, the sharpness of your mind, like uh, can have such a dramatic impact. You know, obviously he learned sales very well, but mm -hmm. is that, that that sense of presence? is the most important thing. But some of us, we don't have access to presence internally to out, you know? So we have to find mm -hmm. it externally first in. And um, yeah, regardless. Yeah, actually, I mean, if, if there's any criticism, I feel like like on a value level about the looks maxing thing, it's like, I get it. Yeah, But it's because of that, actually, I mean, even though the pickup message was really just to make money and sell pickup coaching, it's just the idea that, again, looks don't matter. Like you can learn something, your character can overcome things it was really uplifting for me because I would have disqualified myself otherwise as a short guy. And I guess uh, I'm, I'm concerned about younger guys being so externally driven that they kind of miss the point. I think a lot of these external factors and the nature of the world being very superficial and more superficial than ever, it is true. But you need to almost forcefully delude yourself into thinking it doesn't matter. And you need to forcefully do whatever it takes to convince yourself that you are like quite spectacular. And a lot of times we have to fight to achieve that internal sense within. And it's worth, you know, doing that fight for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, I think it's better. To, it's almost like, you know, do you believe in fate versus like determinism versus free will? You know, there is a great argument to be made that like there, like so much of us is like genetics and mm -hmm. determinism is the real thing, but you're better off just going into the world as if I, you know, create my own fate. I can change my stars. It's a better, like it does actually. And I think the world bends to whatever belief system you throw upon it, you know, yeah. whatever. You I mean, believe. people, especially, I yeah, think yeah. like if you act a certain way, they treat you a certain way. And that's just how yeah. it goes. Usually. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So on a similar ish vein, like a few years ago, you were doing more videos on in being Indian. Uh, I think yeah. I saw the video with Yogi Oabs or the thumbnail from a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess I was just, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on it now. Um, in general, I think in terms of like being Indian in America, I would say 
and I've, I've actually done like street interviews. It's funny you brought this up because I actually was trying to like pull people on the streets. Like, why is it that Indian guys have a hard time dating in America? That video I made that you're referencing, the, it, it ended up getting great views. And the audience that watched it was Indian guys and black women because black women mm-hmm. have really hard time in the dating marketplace in the West as well. So they're really connected with the topic of the video actually, which I didn't expect. But I think there is a huge demerit on your perceived attractiveness if you're an Indian guy. And like, it just, it totally is there. Like, I, I think I would have to become a much higher quality person. You know, if like the sex, if the scale thing is true, if I'm a nine, I would say being Indian probably knocks me down to a six or a seven, just in the way people, how attractive they would find me, at least with their like actions. I think it's there. I, I would say that has been true of my experience. Do you think that lasts or has this lasted beyond the first impression with you? Like after they meet you and talk to you, or is it really just like when they see you, he probably think, bobbles his head or something? I think honestly, when the, when they see me or initially consider me, maybe they don't think about it or doesn't, because I read as like a fairly put together person. And I do, I do present as very American, you know, just because my voice is, I, I have a, I grew up in Minnesota, so my voice is American and, um, I guess I present myself like as in the mix of the culture, but I think sometimes it even shows up later, you know, like I, th- I would argue, and I mean, maybe my experience is not relative to what other people have had, but I think a lot of Indian guys, they marry the girls that their parents want them to marry, like, you know, to this day, or they just like seek out girls who are Indian from their own inner constitution. And it's just as a way of not participating in the marketplace. Like they don't even want to know how they would rank in the marketplace because they, they have like this in, in, intrinsic understanding that it would be bad. And I don't know too many interracial couples, you know, from like guys who are Indian. Um, so I think it actually sometimes manifests later. Maybe a girl like is interested in you because she doesn't really think about it at first, but then later on this sort of in tribe bias comes up yeah. and I think it is overcomable. Like I think my way of dealing with it is to try not to think about it at all. And just mm-hmm. assume it's not, just like the determinism thing, I try to assume that it's not there. Like I, I try to assume nothing is holding me back, you know. Yeah, but yeah, actually, I'm reminded of like I had a buddy in college who was Indian who was a total stud, like, and mm-hmm. he, he mostly went after white girls, almost yeah. maybe maybe even fetishized. I don't even know. Yeah. But right after college, he broke up with his white girlfriend and married an Indian girl to please his parents, and which was like a shock because he was like yeah. the biggest player that I knew. And uh, I think that also happens. I mean, kind of yeah. reverse. A lot of Indian guys are really afraid of their parents, you know, and yeah. that sort of thing happens where like they will pretend to run their own life for a while or, you know, just like be a player if they're in that phase. And then they will just like, and there's nothing wrong with it. But like, you know, in Minnesota, I am the only one of my breed. I am like the only guy who's like unmarried, 30 years old a YouTuber as a profession. And in order to like enact my own life and make my own decisions, date who I want to date, I, it, it got to the point where my dad and I almost got into like an actual fist fight, you know, like it was, it was years of yelling at each other, hating each other. My parents crying. My mom's like, I'm going to fucking kill myself. Like you're not marrying an Indian girl. Like, and I somehow, I don't know why I, I persisted. You know, I, I just like, I can't help but be who I am. And uh, I guess just, I think honestly that my parents gave me their obsession, you know, it's just that I transferred it into like an artist's life. So yeah, you're, uh, you're, you're, I just watched your interview with your dad. It was definitely a tear oh, trigger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> even before I saw you guys get emotional, it was like the hug at the end. I don't know mm-hmm. if it's just cause you were sitting, but like, yeah. I always have super awkward hugs with my dad where we don't really touch each other. <laughs> so really? I don't know if that's your normal, but it's so hard for us to say that we love each other. You know, but I, I, the reason I even felt any emotions, like I feel like the only thing standing in the way between me being this successful person, you know, in, in the place that I'm living and me just having been like just a poor kid in India, like is my dad, you know, he literally was a poor kid from a village and he just decided there's only two ways out of poverty. You know, you either become an IAS officer, which I don't know, actually know what that is, but it's like some high level government job or you become a software engineer. And the technology schools are desperately hard to get into because everyone knows that's the only way out of poverty. 
So if you're going there off of a merit, like you earned your way and it's like a hundred students get accepted or something like that out of like 20,000 applicants. I mean, there's so many fucking people in India that it's just hard to break through. So it was just like enormous efforts. And my dad, I think just was a very special. And it's, it's like, he was, he's the richest man, even his brothers, they're, they're still in like the same, well, one of his brothers, same village, no one left town, you know, he's like the only mm -hmm. person who left this small town. So I feel this enormous burden of like how great he is. Like I, I have this, I think it is true. I would, if I was in that village, I would have stayed in that village. I don't think I'm as like remarkable as my dad is as tough as of a guy. I work as hard as I fucking can every day. I just go as hard as fucking any, any hour that I'm not working. Like if I am on a date with a girl or something, I'm just honestly kind of like, ah, fuck. I, I hope I'm not a full of shit. I wish I was working, but uh, I just think my dad is, you know, better than me at the end of the day. And I'm like the pro like one tier down. I feel like my dad's Marcus Aurelius. And I'm like Commodus, you know, like I'm like walking Phoenix. I'm like the shitty son who like was given the good circumstance. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm but actually back. kind of in a similar way. Like he was an anomaly for his environment and you're kind of anomaly for, I guess you're referring, I guess, to the Indian American community in Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah. I, that is true. I, I definitely have that quality inside me. It's just maybe mm -hmm. manifesting in a different like sphere of life. You know, I'm trying to make it in life as an artist. My, my dream in life is still to become like a director, you know, a proper filmmaker. And I think a lot of people can relate with that struggle of like something feeling impossible and you're fighting for something. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Okay. I have one more question about it's like kind of a theory based on yeah. anecdotes about brown men. So yeah. like I know a lot of Indian guys who are super charming and like they're not what you would expect you know, they just, they just seem to have figured out it's specifically Indian Americans. Like they grew up in America. They're maybe athletic. They're good looking. They speak like everything. And, and, and people always think that they're a stud because they're so charming. And then when I got into dating coaching, I found out a lot of guys like this, maybe because of fear of their parents, as charming as they are, they're kind, they, they basically don't have success with women or they're a 25 year old virgin or something. Like I've met a lot of that where it's like, you think they must be such a player and people love them, but there's some like inner block, if you will. And I, I was wondering if you had any insight, because this is something I've seen a lot. I mean, I do feel like at least some portion of that applies to me, where I think my social skills, at least in high school and college, were strong. I actually developed some kind of social anxiety later on, like in my mid-20s and beyond. But I, I'd say I have often had trouble dating and like attracting women and like being successful with women and like holding on to them. Um, and the only era of my life, I don't want to turn this into, I don't want to hijack this into like a no fap semen retention conversation. Cause it might seem too cringe or something, but the only eras of my life where I have, I felt like women just fucking adored me. And there were like, I could get a girl obsessed with me and I'm like, I don't even know what's happening is when eras where I've, had like long streaks of like retention and discipline in that way. And I'm not sure what was happening under the surface, under the currents to make that be true. Um, but I've usually had a tough time attracting women, at least be, being seen as like a, you know, like a sexually capable guy to them. Um, yeah. Until, until this year, you know, not that I'm even, I'm not, I'm, I think, yeah, I don't know what your thoughts might be. What theories you? Well, I've had I've had various theories because you know I kind of relate to that. But I grew up like I'm, I'm half brown, so like I, I only had part of that culture. Yep. And um, you know, I have seen and I've spoken to women about it in workshops and stuff. It's like there's something about many charming Indian American men or ABCDs that like yep. everything's great on the surface, but they're afraid of their own sexuality. Yeah. So it's like, it's like a woman will be on a date and she'll think he's handsome and everything, but then something just doesn't feel right if it progresses to physical intimacy. And I've met a lot of guys who like the 25 year old virgins, they have tons of dates, but they never, you know, it just never goes there. Something always goes wrong. Yeah. And, and I don't know if this relates, but like I've coached some guys in India, mm. uh, where like there is kind of a reputation of Indian men being a little bit too masturbatory, especially when they see, say, a white woman or something. There's kind of that mm -hmm. cultural, I don't know, stereotype. But there's some something with that, something with like specifically sex and sexual shame that I'm not yeah. really sure exactly. 
I wonder if Indian people have this strange self-loathing or something like just as a culture, because the only people I've, who have heard talk shit about Indian people like the most are Indian people. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe, maybe it's just like, maybe it's some genetic trauma, dude, as, as a result of like famines in the 1800s or a yeah, right. uh, British occupation. I mean, there's a glorification of white people. Like there's face whitening cream for men in any country where the British controlled. I think a lot of us, we hate our brownness. It's fucked up. I mean, I think I sometimes fall into that as well. What it is, is I hate when we fall into this sort of image or paradigm of like, just we appear like dorky and weak, you know, like any, mm -hmm. any association to my people as like a poo, you know, even though I see like mm -hmm. the, you go to an Indian wedding or something, everyone's skinny fat, you know, like we are this, we, we literally, I'm like probably 11% body fat right now. I still don't have like my lower abs showing, you know, just because that's the last place where fat leaves my body. I'm, I'm coming to realize is like, uh, any, any association with my, the stereotypes associated with me, I'm like disgusted by it, genuinely. Like mm -hmm. I want to present as literally like any stereotype you might've had of an Indian guy, I'm like shattering it, you know? And mm -hmm. I don't think it should be that you should be, one shouldn't be that unforgiving on the, of themselves, you know? Cause there's like white trash as well, you know, like the yeah. fucking white people at the state fair who are all fat as fuck and they look dorky and they don't look, you know, on point. Every, every culture has, uh, they're ordinary people. So yeah. I don't know why we have this, but I well, think, you know, so, I mean, I, I mean, I think every culture in South Asia has like, I actually remember being at a Sri Lankan wedding as a kid yeah. and somehow the adults started eating before the kids and all the kids mostly, mainly, mainly uh, led by teenagers were like, Oh, they would never do this at an Indian wedding. Like, like I think in Sri Lanka, maybe because it's less heard of in the West, there's almost mm -hmm. like, oh, like the Indians are the better brown people. Like they, they'd be kept yeah. shit talking Sri Lankans. Like, oh yeah, Indian people are more noble, whatever. But yeah. it's really, I guess, just self-hatred. Self-hatred, man. Yeah, that makes sense because I feel like, I don't know the history between India and Sri Lanka, but India is obviously like a superpower compared to, they have a, they have a more robust economy compared to Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense that, yeah, you'd see that. And all in America is like a superpower. You know, and the British, they're no longer, I would say, they're not a superpower anymore, but like for a hundred, they had a good run, like a 200 year, mm -hmm. no one did what they did, you know, like throughout history as a whole. So history matters, you know, like these things affect the way we think for like generations. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So all right, I have to ask you about storytelling. I thought this is what we're going to talk about the most, but uh, no, this has all been great. Um, so actually yesterday, I don't know if you mind me sharing, but yesterday on the call, you were you're kind of sh showing your how you incorporate storytelling into a YouTube video. And yeah. it, it kind of seems like an abbreviation of the Save the Cat beat sheet. I'm sure mm. you're familiar. Like, no, which I I, no? No. Oh, it's kind of how like every major movie is framed beat by beat. We're like opening image, uh, establishment of the main character. Yeah. I don't remember them all, but like, you know, there's a dip, yeah, yeah. hero's journey type stuff. Okay. So I guess you're not familiar, but it's kind of like a screenplay every time where you're trying yeah, to go yeah. through a flow. Did you come up with that on your own or is it from your film background? I did. I did. And anything I've come across with YouTube, even like the, the, what I teach, I have hired YouTube coaches in the past, you know, like coaching from vidIQ or like I've read some books. I got no value from any of it. And it makes sense because like channels like vidIQ or like YouTube coaches, for the most part, their own channels don't get good views. So my only way to study, I literally would put on my calendar and I still do to this day, like once a week. I'll put in one hour where I just say study YouTube and I'll find three videos that overperformed from people who are no, maybe no longer small, but they're like, just do it really doing well. And I just ask myself like, why the fuck is this person doing so well? And then I, I, I actually think, you know, to your point about journaling, I think this is one of the most powerful ways to live life is ask questions that you want the answers to, and then assume your brain has the answer. Like tell your brain to produce the answer and then just start writing the answer. Like why the, why is this person, doing so well on why did this video blow up and then just produce the answers as if you're a genius about it and so i stumbled upon all these little like things i noticed where I, you know in the program i say authenticity even for this con conversation i noticed it every time when we first started out the first five minutes of this conversation five to eight minutes we were kind of like yeah man uh yeah and it was just so cool to have you in the program like, just seeing your video you know like it was a little bit presentational 
And now that we're like 30, 40 minutes into it, we're just kind of like chatting. You know, it, that went away. The presentation went away all the time. But it always happens where the first five to eight minutes were like, so then I realized <laughs> the way to raise my credit score was actually to get a credit card. You know, like whatever it might be. Like you end up sounding yeah. fake. Like, oh, the best YouTubers sound so real from the get-go. And that's a, that's a hard thing to do, right? That's not natural because if a camera, the moment a camera starts running, unless we're already friends, you know, like this rapport is now building. So it's easier for us to come across as just two guys having a chat. You have to like learn that. You have to like look out for that. And then same thing with, when I notice a lot of videos that blew up, they give people a reason to get to the end. So like for the storytelling principle, I'm like the premise build, the first 90 seconds have to say a reason to get to the end. And you can't just be like, hey, and the fifth idea, the last one is the best one to so make sure you stay to the end because that's still presentation. It's more like, Hey, by the end of this video, I'm going to try to cook a meal for the, for my mom and she's a harsh critic. So let's see if she likes it or not. Like anything, any small little way of saying, Hey, there are stakes involved in this. There's a story. So I haven't read save the cat. It's been on my list. There's a lot of books I want to read by. I find myself organically arriving at the same points. And then someone eventually will tell me, Oh, did you know that this is this bias or this is this book? And I'll be like, Oh no, mm -hmm. I'm like studying it and trying to like answer it for myself, for myself. But yeah, I mean, you don't the you don't have to market research as much, and you don't even have to worry about so much if the video itself gives a reason for people to get to the end. What might what you might find is people like five months later that video blows up and your whole channel blows up. So many people have that experience, but um, you know, like Isa in our program is one of his videos from like five months ago that I realized crossed 220K views. And I told him, that, I made, that was the first video where I made the thumbnail for him. And I even said on that call, I wish I could find the recording, but I said, dude, this is your first thumbnail that isn't super mid. Cause all your thumbnails have looked like fucking super mediocre until now. And this is the first time I'm like, if you could just make every thumbnail this good, we don't have to deal with all this bullshit anymore. And then, but for me to like be true about that, I had to wait five months cause the algorithm rewards it eventually. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, do you watch YouTube? I feel like a lot of us who make YouTube, we don't watch it as much. Uh, lately, I've been watching a lot of YouTube, but yeah. uh, before, not really. Like, I literally watch maybe like, I mean, the only things I watched in the last couple of years were like jujitsu tutorials. So like mm -hmm. nothing relevant to my my niche. Yeah. there I, I go through phases, but it's only occasional where I get, I really get into someone. Like I, I like vibe with someone. And it's usually because they give me a reason to get to the end in their videos. And I actually feel like that's something I'm trying to cultivate more with videos moving forward. Cause I'm trying to like, you know, my strategy I think is very solid for getting you your video to cross a hundred thousand views. And that's an impressive barrier to cross. You know, so many people's lives would change dramatically with a hundred K view video. But I think to really be someone like people fucking love, you need to give them a reason to get to the end. So, yeah, I mean, what, yeah, what, what, have you studied when it comes to storytelling or what do you sort of look for? Well, I guess like what has been really appealing about your process is that, you know, I did dabble in film. Like I worked briefly as a screenwriter. So like, I know about like these story structures, like there is, and I've always loved being like, on a film set. Like there's something so cool. And I kind of let go of that. It just didn't work out. But I guess this is probably true for you as well. It's like, you know, maybe acting didn't work out, but you're basically making a little movie every, uh, every other week or something. Yep. And like, that's just really fun. Like just that kind of production, you know, that, that whole process is really fun. And like, it, it, you don't lose as much motivation unless the editing takes forever. Like my last video, but yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, it's been cool. It is, it is some kind of, I do worry though, this is like a shadow career, you know, like the YouTube thing. I'm still, mm. I'm trying to use YouTube as like a, a, the biggest learning opportunity of my life to maybe work my way back to the main thing. But I have, you know, the main thing being acting. Maybe now it's the vision is closer to directing. I just don't think some combination of those things, but like something working in mainstream, mainstream media, or maybe just like a narrative project in general that a lot of people watch is mm -hmm. it is an ambition still. Um, honestly, it feels like this thing that I will never be able to get rid of. If I could, if I could stop wanting it, then I probably would hit that button and just like mm -hmm. enjoy my life. Um, I probably would just go ham on like making videos at volume and growing our business 
a lot and probably just like enjoy my life more rather than what, uh, yeah. what genre of film would you make or do you have like a concept or dream project you know i honestly love romance like hmm. classical ro- i'm talking like you know like dr Zhivago or gone with the wind or basically romance that's set in a bigger universe cold mountain stuff like that um I would not have expected that I know, from your videos. Weird, right? I assumed like an action, like a Tom Clancy remake type of thing. Or Yeah, I mean, I, I do love the action genre a lot, especially just for the visuals. But in terms of like, there is there is this idea of like the sweeping romance. It just, there's such a sense of like, that's real life. And there's a sense of longing in that, that the story never ends. Uh and that's the movie, I, that's the style of movie that has now made the least amount. That mid-budget drama um, that's set in a larger universe. Even fucking Twilight, you know, is like captures that sense in just a little bit where there's like this romance happening in this larger war between vampires and werewolves or <laughs> whatever it is. I haven't actually seen it, but I'm kind of like, mm-hmm. thinking that's, that was like a, a shittier attempt of what could have been. So my dream project is actually a story set in the 1920s about a bare knuckle boxer in Ireland who travels to London to get work during the industrial revolution and like, just to like basically make more money for his mom and his sister. And he falls in love with a woman who's outside of his class and a narrative, something like that. So it'd be a combination of like Titanic and Romeo and Juliet and pride and prejudice. It'd be like some version of that. And it'd be very Irish in tone. You probably wouldn't expect <laughs> me as my dream. Yeah, not at all. Romance, you cool. know, when they don't end up together, I kind of really like so, that. So you have the story already. Yeah, I have this like Basically. dream. Yeah, I think okay. an ambition of mine is to make like a short film version of that. I think that's what is achievable for me right now. Mm-hmm. One thing that I've really revised as I've grown older, and I, f- I feel like some a lot of my dreams have died or just like re, you know, I, I'm much more interested in just seeing like what is the achievable version of my dream today. You know, that's that's the nature of getting older and experiencing some amount of failure, and. I there's I don't think that project makes any financial sense, but it's like, especially on eras of my life like today where I'm or, you know this week I've been meditating a lot. I feel so driven by projects like that, and I just want to like, um, yeah, dude. Like you're, you're like, dude. I'm so surprised that the romance genre. I'm like, I want to just unleash that, and for people to be like, what the fuck? I had no idea that you were like this. Because there's so much of yourself you're not able to express that is just within the box, you know, the framework of mm-hmm. what my YouTube video, even the pacing, you know, a YouTube, a movie, it allows, it gives itself room to tell the story a little more slowly. Like it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't just start off like a Mr. Beast video is the exact opposite. Imagine if a movie was like that, you know, where they just jumped yeah. right in the middle of the action right away. So um, that's what I'm driven cool. by. What, I'm curious, what would be like achievable exhilaration? I've brought up this concept a lot in your era of life right now. Like what is it that makes the most sense for you to pursue and how has that changed over the years? Man, I don't really know. I mean, I love podcasting. Like I, I mean, I just wanted that to, I would like to have a real studio in a city where people can go to, mm. but as far as like an artistic endeavor, I'm not really sure. I mean, honestly, having a kid is kind of, I, I feel like I'm investing in a new character. Like I, I built out a pretty cool, bachelor character which is a good direction and then i just decided to start over like, that's honestly what it feels like where like my stats are back at zero and like fuck i don't even know what to do with this character so it's a really hard question for me to do right now like two years ago i would have had many answers but now i'm like i don't know <laughs> I'm, I'm trying youtube right now and we'll see what happens i'm curious if like what i'm pursuing in life is going to just seem completely irrelevant because i feel like i'm not uh, somehow i i feel like i'm going to have a kid soon like maybe in the next next one to two to three years and i feel like i'm like oh i don't care about this anymore like some things are going to change within me um but it's that kind of it's just maybe it just there are there comes a time where it just makes sense you know that just feels right i've often gone back and forth on the question of like children well definitely like when it comes to relationships i've often just backed off of relationships really aggressively if someone wants too much from me i don't know why but when it comes to having a child, there was a moment where I realized, oh, that makes sense. It feels very like, like a purpose is being fulfilled. You know, it's like the reason why we're here. So uh, I'm curious how my goals will shift as time goes by. Yeah. 
Well, careful. I, a couple of years ago, I said, I definitely want a kid. I wasn't even dating anyone. And my friends yeah. laughed at me and yeah. I became like very quickly. I feel like when so, it happens, it happens quickly. You know, like yeah. if you feel, I think there is an energy to things. If you feel like you're ready for something, things can happen quickly. You know, whereas I'm not, not committed to anyone right now. Mm-hmm. But if that era of my life came, I bet it would come about fast. <laughs> Just knowing me. And whatnot, dude. I, f- I feel like I've derailed this entire podcast. I hope I hope we didn't. No, it's cool. No, no. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I want to talk about brown things and uh, and stories, and we hit it. So that's great. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. been fun. No, cool, man. I appreciate you making the time. Uh, not to be too presentational, but like you know, this has been great. I'm happy. I'm I'm excited to see your short film. I hope you make put it out sooner than later. I'll do my best, man. Yeah, thank you. I, I want you to see the the romantic, <laughs> the, the romantic, romantic side of Nikhil. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Yeah, dude, it was fun to be on. Thanks for inviting me. For sure.